welcome to you today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is being filmed on Thursday here in Cape Town. My name is Jeff. I am the minister of the, the People's Church. It's in Constantia. And being a true Cape Townian, I like to talk about the weather. Most Cape Townians do exactly that. And we are in the middle of some severe uh, cold fronts that are coming through. And, and the rivers are in spate and dams are filling up well. And trees are being uprooted by the wind. Cape Town is called the Cape of Good Hope. It wasn't always called that. As the Bartholomew uh, dies when he came around and, dis and uh, sailed around for the first time, he called it the Cape of Storms, and, but it was renamed. Uh, things can look different at different times, and we must all be willing to, to change our minds about things as well. Labels are not permanent. Uh, people are not static. They grow, they become, and they develop. And uh, this Sunday is Father's Day, and I want to just pray for fathers. So why don't you just join me as I pray? And so, Lord, uh, being a father is a tough gig. Pray that you give us grace. And as I share what I have to say today, uh, may it be help. May people find it helpful. May people not feel got at, or be or manipulated, or be shouted at. May they feel encouraged by the end of this time. I ask it in your name. Amen. So, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus said, Be as wise as a snake or as crafty as a snake and be as uh, innocent as a dove or as harmless uh, as a dove. Be as shrewd as a snake and as harmless as a dove. Martin Luther King, took that scripture verse and he wrote a, an essay about it. He talked about having a tough mind and a tender heart. And if you're a dad, you need to be tough-minded and you need to be tender-hearted. I do as well. Uh, all of us in the world need to have tough minds, determined and set on a course. But we need to have a tender heart as well. And I'm talking about this ambivalent state that we have to be in. I'm talking about the problem of a macho culture in our world and in our nation. Macho, what does macho mean? It means, according to the dictionary, to be assertive or aggressive. Aggressive manliness. Assertive, dominating, dominating, domineering are other words that are used. An exaggerated sense of power and that of manifest destiny. Uh, so that's what the word means. It's not just a male thing uh, that, I'm, that I'm speaking about. Uh, it's not just the, ma the macho. We think of macho, we think of someone who, who works out uh, all the time and wears a t tight T-shirt and who wheel spins his, his motor car. I was at, uh, at a Nando's. I won't tell you where it was. So you can't identify who I'm speaking about. But I was in the queue waiting to place my order. And a man who I know is, is a boxer, actually a world champion boxer, came. And I watched him through the shop window. I watched how he parked his car. He didn't park in a parking bay. He parked in the lane so that cars had to drive around. And put his, he didn't even close his car door. He just left his car door open. And he came in, this man. And he... Uh, strode up to the strode up to the counter and made his order, and everyone just got out of his way. The world champion boxer, he was the epitome of 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 macho. No one was going to argue with him because of who he was. But it's not just a gender thing. It's not just a male thing. It's not just a a a, a person thing. It can be a societal thing as well. You can have a macho culture in society. Nations can be macho in their view of life. I use the phrase manifest destiny. It was a doctrine that was articulated in the United States in the 1860s that they were destined as a nation to dominate. That's why they could annex Texas. 
That's why they had to buy Alaska. That's why they could go and dominate the indigenous uh, Indian peoples there because they were innately superior and virtuous. It's what they it's what they believed. They believed that their destiny as a nation may be given by God, but their destiny in, 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 in as a nation was to uh, was to dominate the world. It was inevitable and justifiable because they were they had the moral high ground. They were the best. That's why they could do it. So foreign policy can be macho. In South Africa, apartheid was a macho type of manifest destiny. It had that tone to it at any rate. We are Christian and we are civilized and we have the best way. That is why we are in charge. Fathers can be macho. Hey, I'm the father of the house. I'm the leader of the house. I'm the one who says what happens. That's macho. Societies can be macho. Do you know that churches can be macho as well? Churches can be, can be, can be, when people migrate to churches, people move from one church, they move to another church, the, the receiving church can have a macho approach. Well, they came because we better. That's why they came. It's, it's, it's just right that they, that they came. We are superior after all. It's Father's Day. And I want to bring this from a global picture of macho down to the personal level. Let me give you some symptoms of macho. How do you identify macho-ness? Number one, this isn't stuff I got out of a book. This isn't stuff that I got from a lecture or a TED talk. This is something that I just am, uh, that I've, I've thought and, and I'm sharing with you. These are my my thoughts here. Symptoms of macho. Number one, certitude. Being certain about things. In one sense, it is, it is, it is good to be certain. But it, it'll be clear as I, as I talk what I'm referring to when I say certitude. Here's some uh, expressions of certitude, being certain about what you say. One, intolerance. Black and white thinking. Right is right and wrong is wrong. I just happen to know what is right and that's where I take my stand. I'm certain about what I'm saying. I know where I stand. You see, there's no space given for allowance. There's no recognition of the complexity of life. There's no space for nuance or tone. I've made up my mind. My heart is rigid. There's rigidity in my heart and in my thinking. However, I want to ask you a question. If you're such a person, right is right, black and white. That's the way that it is. I know, and that's why I'm doing what, and I'm laying down the law in my family. I'm the one that is in charge. Have you ever changed your mind about something or someone? You are certain, but you've changed your mind. Well, I have, at any rate, see people in a different light. People that you are clear about, you now you see them in a different light. No margin in your thinking, no maybe. Why? Because I know I've got certitude. But the Bible does say this, be slow to speak or come to an opinion or vent your opinion or, or come to a conclusion because once you've said it, it's said, be slow to speak and be swift to hear. In about, it was about 1970, there was a combined prayer meeting in the Assemblies of God Church in Salisbury, that was, now Harare, in McCleary Avenue. It was a combined prayer meeting, and it was combined with a church from Highfields, which was a township, high density, they call it, uh, in Harare. And so the Assemblies of God Church in, her, in Highfield was coming to the Assemblies of God Church in McCleary Avenue, and they were having a combined prayer meeting to pray for the nation. Well, they were pretty sure about things, as, as it become clear. At that time, there were terrorist attacks. 
cars had to travel in convoy uh, on in the open road. Uh, there were landmines, people were being killed, and all young men had to go to war. Uh, the older men uh, also had to play their part. They, they had to be in, uh, in, on guard and march around the suburbs. They called them the Seleucid Scots, um, those, those people, uh, the, 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 old, the older men. But the people prayed. They prayed with such certainty they asked God to roll back the tide of evil. They asked God to protect them from the people that were invading, the guerrilla uh, uh, soldiers. And they asked them uh, to defend the, their civilization and their society from the Marxist, Maoist invasion of guerrillas uh, that were coming and were supported by communist nations that were coming in to take over. That was how they were praying. And they were they had no doubt that they were praying the will of God. And uh, at that moment, as the, in the middle of the prayer meeting, a woman lifted up her voice. She lifted up her voice in heartfelt and emotional prayer. She came from the, the Highfields Church. And the church fell silent as they realized that she was praying for her son and his safe return. He was a guerrilla soldier. And she and and, and, and and she was praying with all of her might to the same God that God would keep her son safe in what he was doing. You see, the certitude, maybe there is nuance, maybe there is change, maybe, maybe there are two sides to the coin. That is what I mean when I talk about certitude. This is what certitude does. A major culture leads to division. It leads to stereotyping. It leads to they language. It leads to lumping a whole bunch of people together as if they're cornflakes and you put them in the Tupperware. And I thought of that because I had cornflakes this morning. And, uh, and everyone is just the same. They, we all are, they are like this. It's us and them in and out language. It leads to the alienation of some people from other people. Macho leads to alienation. It is not healthy. Taking up sides. Not only does it lead to isolation and us them thinking and in and out thinking, matter leads to emotional isolation because matter is hard. Uh, the matter culture leads to us being unapproachable because we are right. We are flinty. We are set in our ways. I've made up my mind. Don't confuse me with facts. I don't want to know about another side to the story. And frailty becomes doomed to being labeled as weakness. And a tentative approach is viewed as a weak approach. The macho church culture can't tolerate weakness and struggle. And people who find the macho place, uh, the macho church, they, people who are struggling find the matter church the last place where they're going to go for, to for help. So just to take an example, a financial difficulty. You're in a matter church culture and, you, and you, your family's in financial difficulty. You approach the oversight. So they send someone to come and do an audit of your expenses. They come into your house and they say, we need to see what you're spending your money on. You're spending 600 rand a month on dog food. That is ridiculous. The dog's got to go. You cannot, in your care, you cannot afford to keep a pet. The dog has got to go. I see the magazines lying around here. You spend a lot of money on magazines. Let's just add up how much you spend a month on magazines. And we'll see how much money you actually are wasting. Not that you've got a financial problem. You've got an attitude problem. That's what you've actually... DSTV. You've got DSTV. That cannot continue. Are they right? They probably are right in what they're saying. Does the person that they're dealing with feel helped? The person that they're feeling that they're dealing with does not feel helped. They feel alienated. They feel beaten down. They feel pain as a, as a consequence. The macho experience of oversight is not a helpful experience uh, for them. And so they experience the 
oversight, as judgmental, as powerful, as certain about what they are saying. They experience church as harsh. Is it right or is it wrong? Well, maybe it's somewhere in between the two. Maybe it's in a gray area. Maybe there is are changes that need to be made. And maybe there needs to be compassion blended in with, with truth. People don't know care how much you know until they know how much you care. Uh, you can't draw ten t- drive t- 10 tons of truth over a bridge designed to take three tons. The bridge will collapse. Um, how much relationship bridge do you have with the people? Are the people going to feel helped? Macho isolates people. Churches can be macho. Emotional, emotional isolation. Let's continue. Macho doesn't only isolate them. It isolates the macho as well. It isolates the dominator. The macho individual cannot find the help that they too so desperately need. They live alone. They live in their space. Uh, they have the fortress of their strength. They have the moat of their certainty uh, that keeps people out, but it keeps people out. And so they're not able to communicate with, with people. Macho, let me tell you something. Macho is not comfortable, it's not helpful, and it is not healthy. So how are you? The answer is fine, but you're not fine. You're not fine. But you match her. You can't say, I'm struggling. Uh, you are isolated, lonely and alone. You cannot afford to accept help. I'm a fine, I'm okay. I don't need help, thank you. I've got my, I've got my stuff together. I'm okay. I'm in control here. <laughs> macho. It's not a good thing. We need to avoid having macho families as well. The macho person cannot allow themselves to be vulnerable. Hans spoke about it last week. They cannot say, I feel ashamed. They cannot say, I've made a mistake. They cannot say, please help me. Church can be macho. The message can be one that identifies success as being the same as spiritual. Success shows that God is blessing you. Not necessarily so. The Psalms show that. The psalmist looks at the successful people and says, why is God blessing them? Because they're not good people. And I'm a good person. I'm doing everything that I can to please God. But I'm struggling so much. You see, success and God's blessing don't necessarily go together. The idealizing of success. If you're a Christian, you're going to win all your races. You're going to play for the A-team. You have a great story to tell. That's macho thinking. Churches should not be macho. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 230. But brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly and despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that we may only boast in the Lord. That's the way that it is. If you're going to do any boasting, let it be boasting about what Jesus has done for you. There's no space for macho in that. Triumphalism is a word that is coined uh, to describe how church become, uh, can become, and it is not healthy. So we've narrowed the conversation down from nations and societies to churches. Now let's talk about families. Here's what the Bible says. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. In other words, don't crush your children's spirits with your macho attitude to life. Please, guard against macho in your family. It's not necessary. It is not helpful. 
and it leads to children with crushed spirits. We need to guard against macho. It's so unhealthy. Allow for nuance. Listen carefully. Be approachable. And for goodness sake, be fun in your family. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Don't be hard on your children so that they feel they're never going to be good enough. Don't do that. Don't do that. That is so destructive. I did the Argus in a previous the Argus tour, Cape Town tour, it's called now. I did it in a previous life, and you might not believe me, but I do have a certificate to show that I not only completed that race around the Cape Peninsula, but I did it in a good time of three hours and 42 minutes, which is a good time. And I came 3,000th out of 12,000 people. In other words, I was in the top quarter. That's jolly, jolly good. Someone came and they said, you came 3,000 and you put it on your wall. If you came first, second or third, you'd put it on your wall, not 3,000. I was proud of it. Be proud of your children's accomplishments, even if they're not the same as your neighbor's kids' accomplishments. Your kids are not there to make you look good. Encourage your children and don't exasperate them. Don't be hard on your children. Don't be a macho dad. Be a fun, approachable, listening and tolerant dad. Advocate for your children. Advocate for them. Don't be a macho dad. You know, the adults aren't always right and the children aren't always wrong. Don't back the adults every single time. Don't back the children every single time either. You've got a brain in your head and use it. But it was a time. Children had to go to school across town. They were in primary school. And uh, I went to collect them from the bus. And uh, there was a, a kerfuffle there. There was a boy that was crying. And he said, my son Timothy had pushed him or tripped him as he got off the bus and he'd gone sprawling. The mother was stone mad. And she said, I'm going to see the headmaster tomorrow and I'm going to report your son for what he did to my son. My son said, Dad, I never tripped him and I never pushed him. I never did what he said. I thought, well, she might be going to the principal. She'll have to be up very early to be at the principal before I'm behind. Ten past seven. I was there in the car park. I was the only car in the car park waiting for the principal to arrive. When he drove his car into the car park, I walked up to him and said, can I please have 10 minutes of your time? And I told him the story. And I said, I believe in my son. And I'm advocating for my son. I know him. You know what he said to me? He said, well done for standing up for your son. He said, I know the mother. I know that child. Don't worry. I have trouble uh, with him in other areas as well. As well, and he said to Timothy, "You were sitting right there." He said, "Timothy, I believe what you're saying. I'm so glad that I stood up for my son. I stood up, stand up for your for your children. Stick up for them in those situations. Don't be hard on them, and don't be a macho dad and say take it on the chin. Don't do that. Advocate for your children. I'm going to end off by just telling you." about a song and maybe the link can be put in and you can enjoy the song as well. It's a song that I found really moving and powerful. It's a song by James Blunt who you probably know and it's called Monsters. It's a song that he sings as a farewell to his father. His father had donated a kidney to somebody so he only had one kidney and in the one kidney that he had it had become diseased and he had a stage four kidney disease. And they were waiting for, hoping for a transplant, a donor, but none had come up so far. And so it was very likely his father was going to die. And so he sang a song and uh, uh, that he sings with his father sitting next to him because his father didn't die. Um, his father did get a, 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 a kidney transplant and was given a further lease on life. But here are some of the words on that song. 
he says, oh, before they turn off all the lights, I won't read you your wrongs or your rights. The time has gone. I tell, tell you good night, close the door. Tell you I love you once more. The time is gone. So here it is. I'm not your son. You're not my father. We're just two grown men saying goodbye. No need to forgive, no need to forget. I know your mistakes, and you know mine. And while you're sleeping, I'll try to make you proud. So, Daddy, won't you just close your eyes? Don't be afraid. It's my turn to ch chase the monsters away. It's a beautiful song. It's a song of love from a child to a father. And what he's saying is, I was a child and you chased away the monsters when I had nightmares. But now I'm a grown man and you have the monsters and I'm by your bedside to chase your monsters away. You know, I love that song because it's vulnerable. I love that song because it's a son reaching out to a father, but it's a recognition that's at the that it is a lifelong relationship. I love that song because in spite of its vulnerability, it is sung by a tough man. He was a captain in the military and distinguished soldier was James Blunt, and his father was also a colonel in the army and a distinguished helicopter pilot. So they weren't just sissies having a sob story together. They were, they were tough men, vulnerable men. That is what we want. Macho is weak. Vulnerability is strong. May you, on this Father's Day, be a strong father. And if you're a child, may you be a loving child to your father. May God bless you. Right now, I am sitting in our toddler church facility. Last week, in the first service, we had 16 little people running around with dummies and toddlers, um, which was great. And right now, I'm sitting here with the delivery. Um, we just ordered some more toys uh, for our preschool kids because we realized that a lot of the stuff in there was actually broken and they weren't able to play with them anymore. And you might ask the question, why are we spending church resources on toys? Well, let me tell you. Playing is how little people connect with each other. That is how the one little one who feels unsure um, comes and, and another little friend says, come, come play. We're playing baby, baby, or we're playing uh, shop, shop, or whatever, come play with us. And, and so we want to make sure that there's a facility for that. We're also working really hard and on our curriculum and our lessons to make sure that they have uh, the best experience that they learn about Jesus in a relevant, in an age-appropriate way. And also, um, once we're done with preschool and toddlers, we are going to make sure that the upstairs where the primary school kids are is also taken care of and that we can minister to each of these little people in an age-appropriate and relevant way. So I want to encourage you that if you have been giving faithfully, you are making a difference. You are making the futures of these little people brighter because we are impacting their lives in a significant way. So if you would like to give, if you would like to continue to contribute, you can see the different ways of doing so on the screen. Thank you for being a generous church.